Hello and welcome to the second half of our lecture on monopolies. If you missed the first half, I recommend that you go watch that first because that's where I introduce the basics of what a monopoly is and how monopolies arise. In the second half, we're going to dive deeper into the mechanics of monopoly profit maximization and discuss some of the implications for society. So in the first half of our lecture, we finished up with an example of how a monopolist maximizes profit by choosing the quantity for which marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Now, this is true for all firms, that profits are maximized when marginal revenue equals marginal cost. The big difference between a perfectly competitive firm and a monopolist is that a competitive firm is one of many sellers and therefore can't control the market price and so it takes the market price as a given. And so marginal revenue is simply the market price for a competitive firm. But for a monopolist, uh, if it wants to sell more units, it actually has to lower the price. And so marginal revenue is decreasing as it produces and sells more units. So for a monopolist, the marginal revenue curve is actually downward sloping. Uh, and it turns out to always be below the demand curve as well. Uh, so on this diagram here, which shows the market demand curve and the monopolist cost curves, the marginal revenue curve is going to look something like this. It's always downward sloping. The y-intercept is the same as for the demand curve, um, but overall it's going to be underneath the demand curve. Um, and you can actually prove these facts using calculus, and I'd be happy to demonstrate at office hours for anyone who's interested. But anyway, so based on this graph, how do we find where the monopolist can maximize its profits? Well, uh, we're going to look at each possible choice of quantity. And the monopolist is going to maximize profits at the quantity for which marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So right here. And this would be the profit maximizing quantity. And what's the profit maximizing price? Okay, so if this is the profit maximizing quantity, then the price is whatever the price would have to be to sell this much, and that's going to be given by the demand curve, uh, so the price is going to be over here, okay? And finally, we can use this graph to figure out what the monopolist profits are. Since price is here and quantity is here, all right, the monopolist total revenue is P times Q, and so that's this rectangle. And finally, this is going to be the average total cost at that quantity. And uh, total cost is the average total cost times Q. And so that's this rectangle. Right, and so the difference between these two rectangles is this rectangle right here. Right, and so this rectangle here gives us the total profit for the monopolist. Okay, so let's try to apply what we learned just now to an example. The diagram on the right here shows a monopolist's cost curves and the demand curve that it faces from the consumers in the market. So what is the profit maximizing price and quantity? Okay, so profit is going to be maximized where MR equals MC. And so that's over here. And so the profit maximizing quantity is 80. Uh, and then the price is going to be up here on the demand curve. And so the profit maximizing price is seven. And so what will the monopolist profits be? Well, it's going to be this rectangle over here. The length of the rectangle is 80. And the height is approximately uh, 2.75, right? Since the ATC at the profit maximizing quantity is approximately 4.25. And so the profit is going to be 2.75 times 80, which is 220. All right, let's uh, do just one more example. Again, I'm showing you on the diagram a monopolist demand curve and its cost curves, and I'm asking you to find the profit maximizing quantity, price, and the profit. Okay, so what's the profit maximizing quantity? Well, MR equals MC is right here, and so the profit maximizing quantity is 60. Okay, uh, and then the price at Q equals 60 is up here. All right, so P equals 6.5. What's the profit? Profit is this rectangle here. Uh, but one thing to notice is that in this case, the ATC is actually above the price this time. 
So in this case, the monopolist is actually going to be losing money. Uh, the height of the rectangle is 1.5, and the width is 60, and so the profit is actually negative 90, or a loss of 90. Okay, so this example shows that even a monopolist could lose money uh, if the costs are very high relative to the demand. Okay, so now let's talk about the implications of monopolies for society. And in particular, we're interested in whether the behavior of a monopolist results in a socially efficient outcome or not. So in other words, does it maximize total surplus in the market or does it not? And remember, we found out that for a perfectly competitive market, the selfish profit maximizing behavior of the firms does indeed actually lead to a socially efficient outcome. And so the question now is whether or not the same is true for monopolists. Uh, first, let's ask what quantity would maximize total surplus. Well, total surplus to society is going to be maximized when the marginal benefit to society equals the marginal cost to society, right? And since consumers are ultimately the beneficiaries of the goods, and firms are ultimately the ones that are bearing the costs of producing the goods, total surplus is going to be maximized when the marginal benefits to the consumers equals the marginal cost to the firm, right? Now all you have to do is remember that the demand curve is the same as the marginal benefits curve for the consumers. And so total surplus is maximized when the demand curve intersects the, mar uh, the monopolist marginal cost curve, right? And that happens right here. And so the quantity that maximizes total surplus is 350, okay? Um, so as a brief aside, Notice that I said uh, that total surplus is maximized when the demand curve intersects the monopolist marginal cost curve. And notice that I didn't say the monopolist supply curve. And that's because the monopolist doesn't actually have something that we would call a supply curve. Remember, the definition of a supply curve is that given the market price, how much would the suppliers choose to produce? Now this question doesn't make sense for a monopolist because the monopolist can actually control both the price and the quantity, so it doesn't make sense to ask what the supply curve of a monopolist is, right? But the thing is that a monopolist does have a marginal cost curve, and as we've already seen, uh, that marginal cost curve is going to help determine both the profit maximizing quantity and the total surplus maximizing quantity. Okay, so the socially efficient quantity was 350, um, but how much will the monopolist actually choose to produce? Well, it's going to choose to produce where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, and that's right here. And so the quantity would be 200. So what's the deadweight loss, right? Because we've just shown that the monopolist is going to produce less than the total surplus maximizing quantity. Um, well, the lost surplus is going to be the lost benefits minus the lost costs, right? And so we add up the lost marginal benefits minus the lost marginal costs. And that's going to be this triangle here. And so the deadweight loss is the area of the triangle. Uh, the base of the triangle is 150. The height is 8. And so the deadweight loss is going to be 1 half times base times height, which is 600. Okay? So the conclusion of our analysis is that unlike perfectly competitive markets, monopolies fail to allocate resources efficiently in the sense that the amount of production is going to be too low. Another way to say this is that if left up to their own devices, monopolists are going to produce an inefficiently low quantity and set an inefficiently high price, and total surplus will not be maximized. And what that means is there's potentially beneficial trades between the monopolist and consumers, but those trades don't happen because the monopolist wants to maintain a higher price. So this inefficient behavior by monopolists forms the basis of a public policy rationale for the government to step in and regulate monopolists. And so in practice, American public policy towards monopolies falls into four categories. Uh, first, there is what's called antitrust. And this is the broad umbrella of policies that try to prevent monopolists from forming in the first place uh, or breaking up monopolies that are shown to be harmful to consumers. And so the legal basis for these policies is the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 and the Clayton Antitrust Act of 1914. 
and the administration of the antitrust policy is primarily led by the, Depar uh, by the Department of Justice. Okay, second, there's the regulation of monopolist behavior. And this might take the form of price controls or other types of public oversight over a monopolist behavior. Uh, so for example, uh, LADWP is a monopolist over Los Angeles's water and power, and it's controlled by a board of five members who are appointed by the LA City Council. Uh, so although the board members themselves aren't directly elected by citizens, the people who appoint them are. Okay, third, uh, there's direct government ownership of the monopoly. Uh, and so this isn't as common in the U.S. as it is in other countries. But one example that we do have is the U.S. Postal Service, uh, which still pretty much has a monopoly on the delivery of first-class mail, meaning uh, letters, postcards, small envelopes, and small packages. And finally, there's always the option to just do nothing. And this view is born from the recognition that the government itself is made up of people with their own agendas. And so the government is neither all-knowing uh, nor all-benevolent. And so we don't necessarily trust the government to make decisions that are better than what a monopolist would do, right? Um, another argument in favor of doing nothing is that not all monopolists are going to be that powerful depending on the size of the barriers to entry. Uh, Amazon, for example, is by far the dominant platform for e-commerce, uh, but it does face threats in certain lines of business. And so if it charges too large of a cut from either its buyers or its sellers, then it might give a window of opportunity for a competitor uh, to come in and gain market share. And so this threat from potential competition uh, can stop Amazon from taking too large of a cut, and it puts a constraint on its pricing ability, uh, despite Amazon being such a dominant player. Okay, but, but on the other hand, some, argue, uh, some economists are arguing that the increasing inequality and the lack of productivity growth and the lack of entrepreneurship in the U.S. economy uh, is due to overall uh, just lax antitrust enforcement in the past couple of decades. And so these economists would argue that we should be looking to Europe as a model for more robust and modern antitrust and pro-consumer policy. Uh, but either way, I hope you can see that setting good antitrust policy is a difficult task, and the DOJ hires a lot of economists to help them try and do that. Okay, so let me wrap up now by telling you about a few times when antitrust policy was put into practice. One of the most well-known modern examples is the breakup of AT&T Bell into seven smaller regional companies known as the Baby Bells. Uh, before the lawsuit, the Bell Telephone Company controlled almost the entire market for telephone service across the United States, and they were partly able to do this uh, by using their size to bully people into only buying Bell telephone equipment. And so their monopoly on the network was also letting them monopolize the telephone equipment industry as well. Uh, so the Department of Justice sued, and eventually they reached an agreement to break up the monopoly. Another famous instance of antitrust enforcement was when the DOJ sued Microsoft in 2001. At issue here was a practice known as tying, in which one product is tied to another, so that monopoly in one of the products would lead to a monopoly in the other. And so what was happening here was that Microsoft was distributing its web browser, called Internet Explorer, together with Windows. And since Microsoft had a monopoly on operating systems with Windows, it was slowly also gaining a, mon a monopoly in the Internet browser space as well, uh, as Internet Explorer started to push out the other popular browser at the time, which was Netscape. Uh, so ultimately, the case was settled out of court with what many saw as just a slap on the wrist for Microsoft. And finally, here's a more recent example from just a few years ago and that's the blockage of the Comcast Time Warner Cable merger in 2014. Uh, in 2014, Comcast announced plans to acquire Time Warner Cable, uh, but citing concerns that this would reduce competition and harm consumers, uh, the DOJ signaled that if the companies went through with this merger, that they would file an antitrust lawsuit, and this was enough to get Comcast to back down from their plans. Okay, so let's wrap things up now by highlighting the key takeaways from today's lecture. 
so the key takeaways are first that monopolies arise when there are strong barriers to entry. And if the barriers to entry are due to the nature of the good or the industry itself and not artificially created, uh, then we would call that industry a natural monopoly. And in a natural monopoly, uh, the market would gravitate towards a single supplier over time. Second, monopolists maximize profits when marginal revenue equals marginal cost. This is true for all firms, uh, but for a monopolist, marginal revenue is going to be decreasing as it increases its quantity. Third, monopolistic profit maximization results in deadweight loss. Uh, in other words, a loss in the total surplus because the monopolist is going to choose a level of production which is inefficiently low, or in other words, set an inefficiently high price. And finally, because of the deadweight loss from monopolies, uh, the U.S. government is often involved in the regulation of monopolies through a variety of means, including antitrust enforcement, direct regulation, and direct ownership. All right, so that's it for today's lecture, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye.